you were little, did all your teachers say to you, pay attention, like that? They did. You're going to have trouble with this video. Yes, this one's all over the place. Yeah, so this video really is all over the place. I'm talking about a lot of different things. The main thing I want to do is tell you about a light. But in order to do that, I have to tell you a story first, and then I have to tell you some other things along the way. It just gets really complicated. Do you like Agatha Christie? You don't know who she is, okay, all right, well, forget that. Thank you, as always, to my Patreon supporters. You guys are fantastic, and to the people who've made contributions to the website, especially people who've thrown in a few bucks for the Flash Fund. I really do appreciate it. We're almost halfway to our goal of six MF12s, uh, which will be, I think, more than any man deserves. Well, one would be more than I deserve, but uh, you get the point. I want to tell you about a light from Ben Q, and you're probably thinking I'm having deja vu. He's already told me about a light from Ben Q. You're not imagining things. I did do a video on the Screen Bar Plus. That was Ben Q's computer monitor light shiny downy onto the desk thing that I liked so much. I liked it because it helped my eyes, which I didn't know how bad they were till I could see again. Uh, but uh, yeah, this is this is different. This is a different light. And I need to tell you how this came to pass because I think it's quite interesting. And if you're one of these people that's in a hurry, uh, you're not going to like this part at all because it's a story. I didn't tell you last time, I don't think, but I struck up a, a solid friendship with a Ben Q employee. His name is Tin. Uh, T-I-N, and I know it's that because I spent about an hour and a half trying to convince them that it wasn't. I think that with some Chinese companies, they give you um, an Americanized, anglicized name, presumably not to confuse people who don't speak Chinese or know Chinese names. Give me an example of one Chinese name. See, you don't know them either, and I don't. Am I being insensitive to even say this? Well, I spent about an hour and a half yelling at Tin on the phone to tell him it was really Tim and he shouldn't be embarrassed by that and that he could just embrace it and learn how to spell it properly. He got angry about that and he wouldn't talk to me for a long time. He'd just send me one word emails. I, I thought I'd burned that bridge and we wouldn't be friends anymore at all. And I had done something very nice for him. I, I'd come up with a slogan for him to use at work. And that's a lot of work for me to come up with a slogan like that. And I wanted to give it to him, but he wouldn't talk to me. So uh, when I was editing one night and uh, the, the phone rang, as, as it does, and uh, I saw it was Ben Q, uh, I immediately snatched up the phone and said, Tin, Tin, I'm glad you called me back. Uh, I've come up with a slogan that you can use at work. You can, you can tell people they can't. But tin can, tin can. No, okay, all right, well, I'll, I'll work on it some more. I did not realize until somebody told me quite a while later that there are some cultures where they take offense if you shout at them that they don't know how to spell their own name. I did not realize that. If somebody had told me that, I'd have been more careful, more circumspect. Anyway, it wasn't tin on the phone. It was Bella, or Melva, as I've tried to clarify for her. Bella's my new handler at BenQ. She's a more senior person and she has specialty training, hostage negotiating or something like that. But she got, she got to look after me. And the first thing she wanted to know, and this is why I love BenQ so much, was how are your eyes, dear? She wanted to know. Well, she didn't say that in those words. She said hello, but you, you could tell that's what she really meant when she said hello. They say Tin's doing better and should be home soon. Bella told me that they have convened a research team and that the research team wanted to talk to me about my 
eye problems. These people didn't know me from Adam yet. They're all worried about my eyes and they have a research team. So I talked to the research team and they wanted to know what in God's name I was doing were insects that was making my eyes bleed. I went through the whole process and I told them what I did. I sent them pictures to, so they could see how little the things were. And I showed them pictures of me working in my, at the time, current lighting setup, which they found appalling. Third world, they said. They seemed a little shocked and upset at the conditions uh, in which I was taking care of insects. I didn't tell them they were dead, though. They might have been funny about that. So they thanked me for, for giving them all of the details about what the problem was. And yep, they shut the factory down and they invented a light, just one, and they gave it to me to test. You can't buy it because it's experimental, but they may be making it for everybody to buy because it's been so successful at relieving my eye strain. And I've tested it and... I'm going to show it to you because it is beyond something special. Remember that e-reading light? The one with the magic throbby turn-on thing where you touch the button and it whoop, whoop, lights up like that? Hey presto, put it back on automatic. Look at that. I do that all day long. Put that on automatic just to see it do that dipping down and coming back up thing. Well, this doesn't do that, which is disappointing but everything else I'm gonna show you is impressive. I didn't even pay attention to light until back in 1943 when I first started doing macro. I bought one of those things off the television, the clapper. Old people who were bedridden, they got the clapper so they didn't have to get out of bed. Uh, they'd just lie in the bed and when they wanted the light off, they'd go. It was great because I didn't have to get up from my insects, I just. Back then I didn't have any money uh, and I had to improvise. These got me by for a while, but I soon had to get an upgrade. Back in the day, this was pretty lavish. A double LED book light was my dissecting light and it worked, sort of. Stuck myself with pins a lot, but there was good things in store. So this was my first LED light and uh, it was quite good. It was a huge improvement over what I had before, but it was still very difficult to concentrate on what you were looking at if it was small for a very long time. And it didn't work really well with magnifying glasses and uh, you know those visor things. They get a lot of glare on them. So it was better than, than I had, better than nothing. The next thing was a real step up. Now, this may look like a step down, but this was a big step up. This is a more modern LED. I actually got this at a thrift shop, but I love this light because it's on a very bendy arm and it allowed me to get more light around where I was trying to work. I mean, it, it wasn't a lot, but uh, it, was, it was an improvement and nice and bright, nice and white. Uh, you could even kind of change the color temperature. I've, you've got to be very careful what button you press because there's a button that plays music and it is shocking. It's not that one. Oh dear. I don't know what any of these buttons do. Oh dear. Well, that there you go. Well, it's not, not playing the music anyway. You should hear the music and knock my astronaut over. It really has served me well, but it's limited as you can see. And this is what I was telling the research team, that this was nice and it was getting a lot closer to what I needed. And I thought, well, I'll get two, but it's a thrift shop. They only have one and it's broken. So, you know, you can't just go in and say, get me another one of those white lights that I like. They don't do that. So I have my next brilliant idea. <laughs> Needless to say, my next idea was perfect. But I couldn't do any of the two-handed operations that I need to do, like use the microscope or use the tools. There's a consolation, though. I can turn it on and off, which, as you know, is hours of fun. Uh, this, is the, this is the screen bar plus. So I tried mounting it on light stands and things like that, and I just kept knocking them over. But your arm gets terribly tired using this method. 
Uh, and uh, there's also a big problem when you go to edit your videos because you can't see anything. If you're used to having this, bathe your desk in light, and I am, I couldn't see anything without it. So uh, yeah, this was, this was almost a solution, but it did give me an idea. It feels a bit like working in a casino. This was the next thing I came up with. And uh, it's a great idea. I, I, I like the amount of light. It still was focused mostly on where, where I was working. But I tell you, after the third time I got up and jammed my head into this thing, I was using the one with the metal blades on it. This was a good idea, but what if I needed the light for a video? Or what if I didn't want my scalp to be removed every time I stood up and banged my head into this thing? And one time the, the whole stand fell over because I was fiddling with it to try to get it to move. And it was already lopsided and the whole thing came down. So this was the closest that I could get, but I was about at my wits end by now because I was the eye pain was back and the headaches were back. And uh, I was doing a lot of insects. So every night when I got through with work, I'd go get my insects and I'd get my light and start working on my headache, to, like I'm gonna do tonight when I'm through with this got some nice mosquitoes so uh yeah that was that was as far as i could go i when i told you last time i'd used every light in my house i was not kidding i was used i've tried everything i could think of including candles so i've been using some variation on this i tried it with work lights but god it gets hot under here with even the leds get hot and this was what i was using when bella called in fact I was underneath this when Bella called and she said, hey, how are your eyes? Everybody at BenQ's worried to death about you and we've invented a new light for you. Would you like to see it? And I said, bring it on. <laughs> All kidding aside, this is a game changer. For somebody who uh, works with the teeniest, tiniest of insects, and I do end up doing it mostly at night, the, uh, the very best solution that uh, I have ever found is this. The base plate weighs, I don't know, 20 pounds maybe? It's a, it's a solid piece of iron, I think. Uh, it's very, very solid, very heavy. And the light itself is, is on one of these angle arm things, except it doesn't force an angle on you. You can change the angle any way you want, which is so much better than the ones that force you to keep it flat. Because my workspace usually is to the right, and I want the light where I am and to the right. The LEDs, the way they're arranged and the shape of the lamp makes this absolutely the best possible thing for working on insects in a darkened room. And really it goes for working on anything in a darkened room. I fixed a microscope at night using this light where, you know, I had to see everything and uh, it's fantastic for pinning insects and doing your, your cleaning operations and all that. What it is, is multiple rows of, of these really high end LEDs that have very, very true color. Uh, their CRI is uh, 95 or greater and uh, you can tell. Uh, in addition to, to, to having, having color accurate LEDs, they're bright, but they're, they're, there's something in, I wish I knew what the, uh, what the diffusion material was. It's plastic with ridges cut in it, but it doesn't glare at all on anything. So for working on beetles and uh, you know, all the shiny stuff we do, or trying to pick stuff out of little canisters of liquid when you've got a bright spotlight LED on you is miserable. This is fantastic. The way I use it, by the way, the controls are similar to, to the desktop uh, uh, e-reader light. This is an e-reader light too. They didn't listen to me. Again, it's you know, just, just for ease, but there isn't even an E, oh, there is an E in Ben, isn't there? It's a hard word though without seeing it written down, you'd forget there was an E in it. Uh, so the way it works is the on and off switch is this, this silvery looking thing. 
like that. Now, this is almost as much fun as the other. Yep, you just have to touch it. You don't have to clap or anything. So when you turn it on, you've got this knob that allows you to make it not bright and bright, just like on the other one. But if you want to mess with the temperature, which I know you do, because that's the kind of thing you do, you just have to press the button. And once the button's pressed, it lets you change the temperature. So what I do is, I actually, I like that warmer light in the evening. Don't ask me why. Maybe it just goes with the sunset light around here, but I, I'll have it nice and orangey like that. And then as it gets late at night and I need really good light to see what I'm doing with little insects, I like to get it nice and cold. And the other thing is when I'm, when I'm getting the insects batch cleaned, and be splitting them up and putting them in bottles and just cleaning off the, the big dirt stuff. That's where I have the light, like that. And I can have it towards where all my bottles are going to be over here. I mean, not, you know, not those. Well, yeah, them too. Uh, so uh, by having the light movable like this, and it moves a long way. I mean, it covers the whole other half of the table. But normally I have it nice and high right over me for the setup. Then when I actually start working on individual bugs, I bring it down like crazy low, uh, about like that, which is absolutely perfect for me. My line of sight is, is just about here. So this doesn't get in the way. It's curved. Uh, obviously that helps with the light distribution, but it's also perfect for staying out of your your vision it means I can see the door and I can see the clock and everything without a light in the way but I have everything bathed in light I really really love this light and um, yeah and I was not kidding about their research team I was kidding about them shutting the factory down but their, their research people got in touch with me and wanted to know the specific issues and problems that I was having in doing the work I do at night. And uh, they were uh, very interested in every aspect of it. So th that is unheard of for, in my experience. <laughs> Heck, if I paid somebody um, half a million dollars to invent a light for me, they wouldn't be this helpful as these, as these people were. The thing comes in a gigantic solid box. Um, and, and I had to move it out. I should have had it in here for the video, but I had to move it out into a, another room because it's big. Uh, but it's packed. The whole light is packed in expanded polystyrene foam, uh, beautifully, beautifully packed uh, with a, this clever, nifty thing. It's a, like a, a bag, only it's a sling that goes down in the box. So when you open the box, you just pull the, the ins, innards out like that, and it is easy to unpack. I think it's fair to say that people who are up at two o'clock in the morning spreading a fly's legs probably aren't their normal target audience for selling these lights. But the, the effort they went to to make sure that this was the best choice out of everything they had for me and the work that I do, uh, it made you feel like you're the most important uh, client that they have. So uh, it's been a, a really, really good experience. I, I'm uh, super grateful to Tin and to Bella, both who've been so uh, helpful in making the contacts and getting me in touch with these other people and, uh, uh, and just making it possible for me to show this to you. Needless to say, I am super impressed. This is a light that just changes the whole insect prep game at night. By the way, I had some microscope issues and before I got my microscopes working properly, I was using this as my microscope light for my other dissecting scope, just like this. There was enough light coming from both sides to completely illuminate the stage. Glare free, uh, and it really is glare free. Color temperature, you can change. Intensity, you can change. Touch on, touch off. It's gorgeous to look at, made of metal. It's all metal. I don't think there's a bit of plastic on it.
and it's got the magic touch sensing O up in the corner there. So literally not one bad thing to say about Even if I only could use this to read ease, it would still be the best desk lamp I've ever used, period. The BenQ e-reading desk lamp that you see here, they make one that attaches to the table and they make this one that goes on the table. This, this is the one I like, definitely. And uh, this is $230, which is uh, quite a lot of money. Uh, they come in blue and silver and gold and white. And the, um, the thing that I've noticed in, in uh, checking up on the price was that these things are not staying in stock. Good for Ben Q. They make good products. I'm not surprised. But this thing is absolutely killer. I love it. This is the, probably the only light I'll ever use for my insect work. It's that good. All right. Moving on to an invention that I made that I can see right there. So I'm gonna bring that in and we'll do my invention next. There has been a lot more interest lately in uh, folks wanting to get private instruction on some of the more esoteric parts of what we do, particularly things like prepping small insects, that type of thing. And uh, out of necessity, uh, I came up with a, a solution that presented itself to me the other day uh, when I was doing a review of the Apexel uh, 100 millimeter macro lens. Um, you, I, I told you how much I enjoyed playing around with this and that the picture quality was good. Well, just the same day that, um, oh, my spider's come back. I had a spider come back to life and wander away. I'm glad it came back. I'll kill it later. So the same day I did the Apexels review, um, I got a call from one of the guys that I'm, uh, I'm teaching and he had questions about an, a particular kind of insect and some trouble he was having with uh, insect positioning and, and cleaning. And, uh, you know, when this happens, what I usually do, if, it, if it's somebody I'm in, uh, instructing, I'll set up some kind of a camera um, uh, usually a macro lens and a camera and lights and all this so that I can demonstrate to them what it is that they should be doing. So I've been really interested in finding a better way of visually communicating stuff like this to people that I'm teaching. So just the other day, I get the new Apexel lens and a couple of weeks ago, Captain Martinez uh, donated this rather nice tablet stand that I have taken the tablet thing off the end. Sorry about that, sir. I'll put it back on later. Uh, but uh, this thing uh, is just a little piece of, can you even see that? It's just an old phone uh, clip from a selfie stick that I got at the thrift shop, a piece of aluminium that I bent into an L shape and I just bolted it, screwed it onto this See how this thing bends? And then I bolted a really heavy uh, magnet on the... Yeah, it's out of focus, isn't it? That's what you're saying. Put it in focus. Okay, sorry. So here's all it is. Bolted a, one of those really strong magnets to the hole that was in the thing already with some washers on either side. That is incredibly powerful magnet. You could lift the thing up by it. And then this, when you turn it on, gives you, you can put it anywhere you want, but you get the idea. And then it's just a matter of taking your cell phone. So you put it on the macro lens setting, whatever phone you have, put it in video mode, and then all you have to do is don't you don't even have to clamp it though I I I did just to stop it from go all right next it worked great yesterday I'll put a link in the show notes so you can find out what this stand is called and this this uh Magnetic light is great. I use this for all kinds of things, but this setup just like 
this. It worked great the way I had it, it really did. But anyway, this with the Apexels lens, it gives you a perfect uh, area that you know you need to be in. And uh, some of this footage I'm showing you now, this was what I sent to, to my friend Mike. The shape that I drew like that. And the idea now being that when I touch this on the abdomen like so, it should instantly stick. Uh, so I'm gonna, <clears throat> this is the glue I use, it's Loctite, but it doesn't matter so long as it's liquid. It's gotta be liquid. Gel doesn't dry fast enough. So I'll put it where you can see it. I put one drop or a part of a drop is all you need. And then I take my pin and what I'll do is I'll touch the pin in there, turn it over, touch it on the other side. If I can see a blob with my naked eye like I can there, I'll touch it on the paper to get rid of it. I don't want visible blobs. And then right away, before it has a chance to dry in the air, position the pin and just touch it like so then hold it as still as you can for a couple of seconds, pick it up, and that's it. Can you see from the contour how that, that pin just hugs the shape? And it's just a matter of eyeballing the shape and, uh, and trying to match it. It works great. Why am I telling you this? If you decide you wanna get lessons with me and you are having trouble doing something that involves your hands, um, this is what you need to set up so I can see what you're talking about. Uh, if it's a prepping insects issue or if it's a setting up a piece of equipment, anything like that, something like this makes it really easy for me to see what you're doing. I guarantee if I am teaching you, I'll be using something like this for a lot of different demonstrations. Something else that I've been doing lately is making little videos for people who want, um, who want me to explain for example, uh, the, the cleaning insects thing or uh, a particular, there are a bunch of moves and little tools that I make with pins for getting legs apart and digging antennas out of facial grooves and things like that. Nobody is going to sit and watch a video on that, I don't think, but uh, people who, who are trying to do it and want the help, uh, yeah, that's another time you might want to get yourself a personal video so any anyhow i just wanted you to see this because until i broke it it was working great let's change uh, directions a little bit and talk for just a second about the video i just did on setting up your mitu toyo and your rainox for um, 5x magnification after i did that uh, video somebody got in touch with me and said, okay, you've, you've done all of this work to, to get this video together and you've been experimenting with all of these different um, setups. Tell, tell me once and for all, what is the best? Is it 208 backwards or is it 200 forwards? Or what is the best way to use a Mitu Toyo and a Rainox? And in answering his question, it occurred to me that there is no answer to that question because they're both good and they're both good at different times. And I do not yet know what the conditions are that are affecting the quality of the image that makes it better sometimes to go at 200 uh, and uh, reversed as opposed to going at uh, 208 millimeters forwards. I don't know. Uh, all I know for an absolute fact is that those are the right measurements for my Raynox when I actually measure it. So this is something I recommend everybody do. If you have any question about the distance, if you've never done it before and you want to check that you've got it right, mount it the way that you normally would, or whichever way that is, camera on one end, bellows or tubes, and at the other end, you've got your Raynox, either forward or reversed at whatever distance it's at. Take it outside with a tripod, put it on a tripod or a sturdy surface and focus on the horizon, focus on something far away. And 
if you have got the right distance, that far away something will be in sharp focus because that thing is at infinity and you are focusing at infinity. If in fact it's not and it's sharper, closer in, then uh, you aren't focused at infinity and you're not going to get the best results. So when it comes to checking your work, use the camera, take a picture, look at something on infinity, at infinity, and make sure that your bellows is uh, in focus. If not, just loosen up one of the, the sleds and shorten or lengthen the bellows until the horizon is in focus. And then for your particular lens, that is it at infinity. Does that make sense? It's basically just checking that you're doing it right. So why am I uh, telling you that there is no answer to which is the best way to set up the, the Mitu Toyo on the Raynox? The reason I've come to this conclusion is there are too many very talented photographers who are using one of those methods and getting the best pictures. And there's another group of talented macro photographers who are using the other setup and getting lovely pictures. Now, my own personal experience is quite vast as far as the number of photographs I've taken both ways and countless other ways. But I've been keeping tabs of it and I get good photographs like keeper photographs with the same frequency from both setups. But I also get lousy photographs from both setups. And what that leads me to believe is it seems to, to me improbable, if not impossible, that half of the macro photographers are wrong and they just get lucky. Or the other half is wrong and they get lucky. That, that doesn't work for me. They're great photographers. They're not getting lucky. They're doing what works, which means there are two different ways of doing it that work some of the time, but not all of the time. What are the conditions under which it works? That's what I would like to know. If you have any thoughts on this, this would be a, a, a great time to share them. Uh, we could talk about it over on Discord too. But that's the question that I would like to, is it dark backgrounds? Is it, if you're shooting on a dark background or if you have uh, a predominantly green image, you know, where all your light is in one group of wavelengths, maybe the good images are farther apart when you're shooting green. I'm just making stuff up here. But there are some conditions under which one setup is going to be superior to the other, I believe. I just don't know what it is yet. There's nothing else that makes rational sense to me. I hope that makes sense to you. So it's a work in progress. Maybe one of these days, somebody out there is going to narrow down one particular variable that when it's present, you want to shoot reversed. When it's not present, you want to shoot forward. Uh, but I don't know what that is. So we'll just have to wait and see. But that's, uh, that's why you're never going to get an answer from me, not yet, as to which is better. They're both great most of the time. One last thing, and I'm very reluctant to do this, but I am not getting any uh, better with the email situation. It's impossible for me to keep up and I'm getting further and further behind. Last weekend, I spent 37 hours answering email. I want to answer all of your emails and I am going to try to do that. But from now on, I am going to give answering, reading and answering priority to people who have helped the show out. So somebody's going to want to know, well, how much does it cost to get access to you? I don't know what that amount is going to be, but it's going to be uh, set to give approximately 30%, uh, I'm guessing, about a third of the people uh, that watch the videos access to me. And that's a lot of people, but it's manageable. I think it's manageable. I have to come up with priorities. And the priority is if you help me, then I will help you first. I'll help everybody if I can. But does that make sense? 
I hate to do this, I really do, but I don't see any other way that I can do videos. It's just, I'm so exhausted by the time it comes time to do the next video, I just don't have the energy. Don't, uh, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm, I'm saying that anybody who has or does donate X amount is going to have their emails answered first. That may still be tomorrow, depending on whether I'm shooting a video or editing a video or whatever's going on. I'm just saying yours are priority. They will get read and answered first. And then when they're all done, and only when they're all done, I will get on with the rest of them. And when the mood strikes me, uh, I'll pull another 37 hour weekend and get them all done. But I want to have the option of not having to if things are really hectic and also uh, feeling like I have helped the people who have helped me. This is a way hopefully to make a little money for the channel uh, at the same time as reducing the commitment to answering all the email. So that's what we're going to do going forward and we'll see how it works. Thanks to everybody who has already made a, a generous donation uh, this week for the Flash Fund. If it crosses your mind, please go ahead and do that too. And uh, then you can tell me about it in an email if you wish. There was one other thing I was going to show you. It only takes two seconds. This is praying mantis blood that I've been collecting for years. It's not. It's just, it's that liquid plastic. You can buy it in cans and sprays, but you need the can. You get a can of this stuff. I don't know why I'm opening it. That's a, usually a recipe for disaster. The stuff's really super red. Take a pair of your tweezers. And what I do is, for one or two pairs of my tweezers, I will dip them about four times altogether in the red plastic. And having that padded tip makes these much, much safer for some insects. Uh, I've got a grasshopper here, that's why I got these out. So uh, when you dip them, make sure you dip them long enough, like I think it's three seconds you have to count, or four, something like that. And then when you pull them out, let them start to drip and then just keep them moving. You don't want blobs to form, so you want the, the plastic to harden in no particular place. You just want the, and it'll shrink too. So you'll think you've got these nice big bumper things on it, and then when you come back and look at it, it'll be half that size. Do this, and uh, you'll be glad you did. This, for butterflies and moths, is fantastic. I'd say I invented it, but I probably think the guy who invented the dippy rubber invented it because he was dipping stuff in it already. They do look kind of cool though. I rather like them. I wonder if you could use them for nose hairs. Okay guys, thanks for watching, liking, subscribing, donating, patroning, and just being you. I really appreciate it. I'll see you again in a few days with something else. Until then, take care, stay safe, and be well. Links in the show notes. Oh,